Outdoors, during a hard freeze, the moisture in exhaled air condenses as we speak, becoming visible in the form of rapidly changing misty figures just outside the mouth. These forms appear undefined and chaotic, and they dissipate rapidly. If the speakers inhale cigarette smoke before speaking syllables or words, the same effect can be achieved at normal temperatures. If we then investigate this process in a laboratory using a high-speed camera and laser illumination, the morphodynamics of the spoken sounds become visible and they appear as sculptural figures with clearly defined outlines and very fine internal structures. As early as 1907, Rudolf Steiner pointed to this unknown phenomenon that occurs during speaking. The pioneering work in this area was done by Johanna Zinke, a crafts and art teacher, beginning in 1962 and continuing into the 1980s. She called these flow patterns air sound forms. The appearance and disappearance of flow patterns in the air outside the mouth coincides exactly with the beginning and end of the corresponding sounds. Sinka did not make audio recordings concurrent with her still photos. Parallel audio recording, however, is indispensable in demonstrating an exact correspondence between the acoustic process on the one hand and the morphodynamic organization of the sound figures on the other. This phenomenon becomes scientifically relevant only when the correlation can be shown to be consistent and predictable rather than coincidental. I pursued this proof with the help of appropriate specialized devices and computers and was able to demonstrate that the forms were indeed reproducible and predictable. Some of my recordings will be shown in the course of this DVD, and I have often included the corresponding still photos from Zinke's work for purposes of comparison. In this DVD, we will approach the phenomenon of external phonatory turbulences in three phases. The first empirical part will present the five main vowels, some isolated consonants and syllables taken by a professional film camera at 25 frames per second and using photographer's lighting. For the sake of comparison, we also repeatedly show corresponding still photographs by Zinke. In this way, one can better trace the evolution of this new research. The second part is the core of the experimental scientific proof. A single syllable is recorded using laser light, a high-speed camera and a microphone, and then analyzed in segments of one hundredth of a second. In the third and last part, we will recognize in the microstructures of the speech sounds the fascinating world of the forming forces at work, both in nature and in art, indeed, in all of the universe. What do aerodynamic sound patterns look like? To give an initial impression of what the aerodynamic patterns of sounds look like when they are recorded on video and played back in slow motion, I present four samples from my feasibility studies. Two French words and one German word, spoken by one female speaker and one male, and made visible by inhaling eucalyptus cigarette smoke. The recordings are played back first in real time, with sound, then followed by a repetition in slow motion, but without sound. Pay particular attention to the gesture-like structure and movement of the individual aerodynamic sound patterns and the clear separations in the series. 
For unpracticed eyes, however, this timing is still almost too fast. Bateau. Bateau. Né. Baum. The five main vowels. The vowel A. Ah. A. Ah. A vortex forms along the central axis of movement, projecting straight out into space from the mouth and then moves forward in relatively slow thrusts and then takes on a round shape. As early as 1923, Rudolf Steiner described the vowel A ah as follows. As an air gesture, this A ah is shaped by a stream of air that flows outward but becomes bowl-shaped as it encounters the density of the air outside. The vowel E. E. The vortex of the vowel E moves much more rapidly than the A ah and is oriented slightly downward. Its morphodynamics reveal a clearly delineated boundary layer that assumes a triangular form and appears to be filled with very complex internal structures that are constantly pooling, breaking, and interweaving. Zinke observed and sketched these internal structures in her pioneering work. A later experiment using laser illumination will confirm Zinke's observation and reveal even more details. Steiner characterized the vowel E as follows. When the E is spoken, it is as if something were dammed up in front of our organs of speech. Initially, the exhaled air streams out into the world outside with full force, but it is then held back, arrested by the density of the outer air, and divides. The vowel E. E. In comparison with the vowel E, the vowel E is even more downward directed and much faster, denser, and longer. It is also more unstable, as the strong turbulence indicates. Steiner describes the E as follows. 
When we speak the E, we basically let it develop right at the front of the mouth, which gives it a sharply tapering energy. The E streams out into the density of the external air in the form of a sharp, arrow-like jet of air, like a sword cleaving the external air. Watching the video again, we can see how precise Steiner's description was. The vowel O. Due largely to the position of the lips, the vortex of the vowel O is more ascending than that of the A. Ah. O. Oh. Its flow is very dense, even though the sound was spoken relatively quietly. Steiner describes the O as follows. When we say the sound O, it is as if we were simultaneously ejecting and holding back the air mass, in a certain sense. And as a result, we are shaping the external air, forming a channel of sorts into it, with the exhaled air. Several of Zinke's still photos of the vowel O confirm this description very nicely, showing the sculpting action as it bores into the external air. At the very end, we see once more the round, spherical figure of the O, highlighted in yellow, as it appeared at the beginning. The vowel U. The vortex of the vowel U rises even higher than the O. Its current density seems to be similar to the O, but it is much more fragile and full of turbulences like the E. You can hear the strong turbulence in the air when you speak this sound. Steiner characterized the O as follows. In the O, we divide the outer air and then sense the O as these two streams of outer air merge again. In the video, this separation into two jets of air is evident in the fluctuating, wave-like, turbulent outer layer of the oo, even though the speaker was not especially forceful when pronouncing the sound. Ooh. Most of the aerodynamic sound patterns I recorded are consistent with the air sound forms in Johanna Zinke's still photographs and occasional video recordings. Here are several characteristic examples of consonants in isolation. Before we begin, however, it should be noted that the consonants in our experiments were not pronounced like the names of the letters of the alphabet, which always combine consonants with vowels. For example, d, d, g, g, k, k, and so forth. For purposes of observing the spoken consonants in isolation to the extent possible, they were followed in our experiments by the neutral, barely audible vowel sound schwa. D, in the plosive D, the vortex jet initially flows horizontally out of the speaker's mouth for 30 to 40 centimeters before bending upward at an almost 90 degree angle as if arrested and deflected by some unseen force. T. In the plosive T, the vortex jet streams outward at great speed, only to make a sudden, 
almost 90 degree turn downward at a point 40 to 50 centimeters from the speaker's mouth. Subsequent vertical air flow is due to the aspirate ah, that follows, which is unavoidable when speaking the German or English t. Together, these two sounds are especially apparent on Zinke's impressive still photo. G. The vortex jet of the voiced occlusive G develops much more slowly and with greater luminosity, which indicates that a larger amount of compressed air is used in speaking it. In the terminology of phonetics, this consonant is called compact with good reason. The vortex jet of the voiceless occlusive k is much faster than the g. Its initial direction is downward, but it forks suddenly at a point 30 to 40 centimeters from the speaker's mouth, splitting the flow. It is possible that this second stage in flow formation is induced by strong aspiration, as was the case with the t which we have already seen. Alternatively, the sudden angular formation of this aerodynamic sound pattern could be the morphodynamic expression of the tongue recoiling forcefully against the back of the soft palate, which is essential to forming the k. Tsinka believed she had found unique, rhythmically distributed angular internal structures in this sound pattern. As we will see midway through the video, I was later able to confirm her discovery using laser light. The consonant V produces a characteristic wavy vortex jet that remains strictly horizontal as it flows outward, similar to waves breaking on the shore, until it is arrested at the front end. The friction of the upper teeth against the lower lip in the V is visible here in the formation of repeated waves, shown as indentations in Tsinka's photos. I have marked them with red arrows. In our recordings, the vortex of the L is always characterized by pronounced flow density, fullness, even though the speaker never pronounced the sound especially forcefully. Surprisingly, the vortex jet splits into two, which angle steeply upward, producing a spiral form that we were not able to study in greater detail. In phonetics, the sound L is described as lateral. In a front view of its aerodynamic sound form, the separation between the two main jets is clearly visible, so this designation is fully justified. Some individuals, however, form the L with only one side of the tongue and therefore produce only a single vortex jet. The two lateral jets are also visible in Tsinka's still photo, taken from above. The aerodynamic sound form of the nasal m is especially impressive. It consists of two large, dense vortex jets that move diagonally downward from the two nostrils. This unique pattern develops because the mouth is closed, forcing the exhaled air to exit via the nasal cavity, where the three nasal conchae force it into a spiraling motion.
In contrast to the oral cavity, with its many different movable muscles, the configuration of the nasal cavity is rigid. So the route of nasal exhalation is predetermined by the alternating arrangement of the nasal concave. Zinke recognized these spiral vortices in her photos and attempted to make sense out of them by drawing them with great precision. Slow motion playback of our video recordings clearly reveals the curling shape of these spiral air currents. Um. In the syllable an, we see only a delicate stream of exhaled air for the initial sound a, ah, followed by two spiral vortex jets emerging from the nostrils for the consonant n. In this instance, there is little pressure behind the stream of exhaled air in the vowel a, ah, which barely flows outward at all. Nah. In comparison, in the syllable na, the two spiral vortex jets of the initial consonant n emerge first, and then the characteristic vortex of the vowel a flows out forcefully, its round, full, morphodynamic pattern easy to recognize. This discovery confirms a phenomenon that plays an important role in speech education and in phonation itself. It has long been known that vocalization is most active in the vowel core of a syllable. To free up the voice, that is, to give it clarity and projection, it helps to take hold of the vowel with a preceding consonant. The effects include relieving pressure on the vocal folds. This phenomenon is very clearly visible and audible in the syllables an and na. In 1921, in the Curative Eurythmy course, Steiner explained that when the vowel comes before the consonant, the speaker wants to linger within rather than going out into the outer world. A vowel sound that comes after a consonant, however, expresses the intention to merge into the outer world. Tracing the activity of air used in speaking, as is possible in this video, allows us to truly understand the meaning of Steiner's comment for the first time. Co-articulation Red denotes the outlines of the initial plosive B. Green indicates certain transition in the direction of airflow between the B and the subsequent vowel, which is then outlined in yellow. In the slow motion depiction, one can recognize the air shapes just demonstrated along with their respective typical stream directions and almost geometric forms. Very close observation reveals slight variations in the initial B sound depending on which vowel follows it. The technical term for this phenomenon is co-articulation. I show here full-length versions of the syllables BA and B and abbreviated versions of the others. The syllable ba. The first time, image and sound in real time. The second time, aerodynamic sound patterns in slow motion without sound. The third time, morphodynamic descriptive analysis in three colors.
ب The first thing we hear is the onset of the consonant b. Burst is the technical term through the sudden opening of the lip occlusion. Concurrent with the burst, an initially straight vortex jet flows horizontally out of the mouth. The jet then increases slightly in size as if impelled by a new surge of exhaled air, as revealed in increased luminosity. The green dots here indicate the subtle transition from the consonant B to the vowel A. Ah. The jet's tip changes shape, becoming somewhat rounder, while an additional surge of exhaled air, dotted yellow, assumes the characteristic form of the vowel A ah with its rounded edges. This is how the syllable unfolds. Its structure, especially the transition in green, becomes obvious. The syllable B. B. The burst, the explosive opening of the lips, of the consonant B, becomes audible. The vortex jet that streams out of the mouth at the same time is initially horizontal and very similar to the B of the previous syllable, BA. This vortex jet moves very rapidly. As it expands, it reveals a flow pattern that differs somewhat from that of the syllable BA. Next, the increased luminosity of the smoke indicates a new surge of exhaled air. This, however, is not yet the beginning of the E. We have observed how the flow pattern of the B is directed slightly upward in contrast to the obvious downward direction of the air exhaled in speaking the vowel E. The difference in direction between these two flow patterns gives rise to an intermediate zone, the transition, in green. The morphodynamics of the vowel E produces a figure that is distinctly triangular when viewed in profile, as we have already seen in the introduction to the five main vowels. Inside the triangle, Prominent breaks and internal structures appear, indicated here with yellow arrows. Here we see a photograph of the syllable B from 1970 by Johanna Zinke. Since she observed mainly isolated syllables, she was unable to discover the phenomenon of co-articulation. In order not to enter too much into detail, the next three syllables, b, bo, bu, will be shown with no more morphodynamic analysis. B. Boo.
Buh. When these five syllables are formed, there are two clear main moments. It is always amazing how these flow forms unfold. Syllables constructed on the consonant-vowel-consonant pattern, C, V, C. Of the five syllables I studied, Bak, Bek, Bik, Bok, and Buk, the first two will be analyzed in detail and the others shown with minimal commentary. The syllable Bak, Bak, Slow motion playback reveals four structural stages. The vortex jet of the initial bilabial plosive B appears first, somewhat faintly, changing into a round form as a new surge of air appears. Next to appear is a brief transition, green followed by the characteristic round flow pattern of the vowel A, ah, yellow outline. These forms then dissolve to be followed by a surprise. No more air flows out. This stage is like an interruption or a hole both acoustically and in terms of flow. This acoustic interruption, called tenue in French, is explained quite naturally by the configuration of this syllable, because the vocal folds stop vibrating after the vocal core ah. In other words, the sound of the voice is interrupted for a fraction of a second, while the upper surface of the tongue shifts to touch the back of the soft palate, so the final voiceless consonant k can be formed and projected. After this interruption, the vortex jet of the k emerges suddenly and very rapidly with its characteristic angular structure and abrupt bifurcation. The syllable bec. The vowel sound we are looking at here is the short e, as in the English bet, also short e in German, e in French. Its aerodynamic sound form looks and flows like a mixture of a and e. Bec. And now, to how the syllable develops. First comes the vortex jet of the initial B. First barely visible, followed by a more luminous surge of air for the A, which initially displays the rounded shape of the vowel A. This is quickly followed by a stronger flow, directed diagonally downward, that develops like an indentation. The upper part of the figure gradually dissipates, and the lower main flow displays the characteristics we already recognize from the vowel E. It then pierces through the first round air form. As in the syllable back, the vowel is followed by a morphodynamic gap, which coincides with an acoustic gap and indicates that no new surge of air occurs while the vocal folds are not vibrating. 
The gap is followed by the characteristic morphodynamic pattern of the consonant k with the straight diagonal of its central axis. A division ensues, followed by additional divisions. Speech science is very familiar with the fact that k is one of the consonants that is very sensitive to co-articulation, meaning that its configuration changes depending on its proximity to different vowels. In the syllable bek, for example, the main thrust of the final k is lower than in the syllable bak. We are observing the phenomenon of co-articulation at work. Bik. Book. Book. One conspicuous aspect of the syllables bok and buk is that the aerodynamic sound form of the k suddenly flows upward to the level of the forehead and even higher. Although these syllables were not spoken forcefully, in both cases the flow pattern of the k is plump and full of air from the vowel o or u. Also conspicuous in the syllables bok and buk, in contrast to bak, bek, and bik, is the lack of a threefold split in the morphodynamic pattern. In other words, there are no clear boundaries between the three sounds in each syllable. The airflow from the o or u fuses directly with the air exhaled in speaking the final k. In phenomena such as these, the phenomenon of co-articulation in speech is clearly and convincingly perceptible. Boris Rebach, a cardiopulmonary biophysicist from Paris, had independently of Johanna Zinke been studying the external vortices of speech, which he called external phonatory turbulences, since 1980. I had the good fortune to exchange information about them on several visits in 2002 and 2003. He had made several videos of syllable sequences but unfortunately no concurrent sound recordings. Nonetheless, his images are impressive and confirm fully the existence and reproducibility of aerodynamic sound patterns. Research in this area of speech science and flow dynamics is still very sparse, so a selection from Reback's videos, namely the syllable pa, will be shown here. Once without explanation, and a second time with a brief morphodynamic analysis.
In my initial attempts to study the morphodynamics of sound patterns on a computer at a speed of 25 frames per second, I soon noticed that many subtle details, such as the transition from the initial B to the vowel A, were still getting lost. They could not be made visible because audio and video playback of an individual syllable typically took less than one second. Not until my collaboration with flow researcher François Lucéran of the French National Research Center for Fluid Dynamics near Paris was I able to continue my experiments with the help of laser illumination, a high-speed camera, and sound synchronization. You're looking at a little room in the laboratory of the Institute for Flow Science. The supporting frame prevents any disruptive head movements while the test subjects are speaking the syllables. The room is kept at 20 degrees centigrade and normal humidity. The constant hissing noise in the background comes from the cooling system for the laser apparatus. While it does have a minimal effect on our acoustic measurements, it has no impact on the aerodynamic flow patterns of the spoken sounds. The subject's eyes and nose are protected because laser light can easily cause burns. Also shown here are the camera, 100 frames per second, and a computer for recording the images. We work in the dark, so the thin bluish beam of laser light can illuminate the exhaled air, which is filled with smoke from a eucalyptus cigarette. The microphone is placed approximately 15 centimeters away from the speaker's right cheek. The syllable bec, first in real time with both the sound and the image, then with only the flow pattern without sound, to allow the viewer to get used to these complicated aerodynamic figures. The subject says the syllable bec four times on a single exhalation after inhaling smoke from the eucalyptus cigarette. Bec. 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 Two facts are immediately obvious. First, the vortices and flow structures that human speech produces in the surrounding air are unexpectedly voluminous. Here, the great compressibility of air is made visible. In our living, breathing, speaking, and hearing, we are constantly immersed in the mobile, fluid ocean of the atmosphere an ocean we often forget about because it is invisible. Second, the phenomenon develops at great speed, both acoustically and in terms of its morphodynamic flow, a single syllable lasts less than a second. The acoustic phenomenon seems to be exactly synchronized with the syllable's aerodynamic flow pattern, as our study will attempt to prove. The second syllable, bec, from this series, twice. Once at normal speed, the way we would say it in everyday speech. Bec. Bec. A second time, with only the sound and its acoustic and phonetic analysis. Bec. The oscillogram is shown above, the spectrogram below. These will be discussed later. Corresponding to the image's duration of one one-hundredth of a second, 10 milliseconds, we also cut the synchronized recorded sound to 10 milliseconds for analysis. First, the 40 milliseconds before the short, explosive release burst of the initial B. The lips are closed, and we hear the voice onset, followed by additional audible but dull voiced impulses while the lips begin moving, but still only slightly. Then, 
the voice onset appears as a periodic curve on the oscillogram, indicating that the vocal folds are beginning to vibrate. Once again, in slow motion, with sound. Sudden opening of the lips and the burst of the plosive B concurrent with the emergence of an initially linear and seemingly undifferentiated vortex jet. Now, the next 40 milliseconds in the production and development of the syllable back. In real time, then in slow motion. On the oscillogram, we see the brief onset of the burst on the left, and then the vibration of the vocal folds, not yet fully rhythmical or periodic, that will produce the full vowel A. We are in the intermediate voice onset phase, which is also quite audible. Let's track this transition phase image by image. and the burst of the plosive B concurrent with the emergence of an initially linear and seemingly undifferentiated vortex jet. Next comes an extremely brief phase in which the vibration of the vocal folds is still arrhythmical, that is, not yet fully periodic. An intermediate pattern then reveals itself resulting in a threefold morphodynamic subdivision. On the left, we see the vortex jet of the initial B in red. It has continued to develop and is followed by a somewhat more luminous structure in green, indicating the voice onset transition. The third component is an even more luminous rounded flow pattern in yellow, signaling the beginning of the vowel core A. This three-part structure is readily apparent, and we can even see clear separations between the links in this chain of vortices. The yellow arrow indicates the rounded flow of air leaving the mouth, dotted yellow, which is very similar to the familiar pattern of the vowel A. Ah. This rounded form corresponds to the measurable, periodic, regular vocal fold vibrations shown on the oscillogram. The morphodynamics and acoustics coincide perfectly. The flow pattern of the vowel could still be that of an A. Ah. To the left, the vortex jet of the consonant B has almost dissolved into individual vortices while the central transition portion still retains something of its form, the aerodynamic pattern of the vowel develops somewhat. Zooming in on the gap that has developed reveals a delicate, subtle transition. The 40 milliseconds of vowel core A. At this point, the periodic vocal fold vibrations become clearly readable on the oscillogram. As we already observed at only 25 frames per second, the form of the A is a mixture of the rounded pattern of the vowel A and the more linear, downward-directed figure of the E. The indentation points to a middle stream which flows faster and which will pierce through the initial current of speech breath.
This is characteristic for the onset of the vowel A. The main vortex jet is now strong, and the indentation clearly visible. The form of the vowel core continues to develop. The section of the oscillogram for the next 40 milliseconds shows it beginning to fade away on the right. Again, the acoustics correspond exactly to the flow pattern of the air exhaled in speaking. The oscillogram reveals the beginning of voice termination, that is, the progressive cessation of vocal fold vibrations, and therefore also of voicing. This phase is indicated by the yellow arrows pointing to the right. The lower portion of the vortex jet becomes wavy. Here, yellow arrows point out the obvious deformations called shears in fluid dynamics. No more exhaled air follows because vowel production is now complete and the back of the tongue is already pressing against the rear of the soft palate in preparation for the final voiceless occlusive k. As the external air takes over, the flow pattern of the vowel core A becomes completely destabilized and gradually dissipates. For review and orientation, let's look at the entire syllable Beck. Beck. And then again in slow motion to show the acoustic gap, the tenue, before the burst of the k. k. Frame 326. 10 milliseconds before the release of the k. The flow pattern of the vowel a has dissolved completely. Concurrent with the acoustic gap, a morphodynamic gap is clearly visible because exhalation is stopped. Frame 327. Ten milliseconds later, the burst of the consonant k becomes detectable on the oscillogram, far right. Surveying the whole oscillogram and the entire spectrogram for the syllable bec, we see, outlined here in red, the acoustic gap between the end of the vowel a and the onset of the final consonant k. The gap lasts three tenths of a second and corresponds exactly to 30 frames on our video recording. In frame 198, the aerodynamic pattern of the vowel A shows the first deformations and shears where the voicing has stopped. Frame 328. 10 milliseconds after the consonant k has sounded, its vortex jet has yet to emerge from the mouth. It appears only in frame 329, purple arrows, and then develops with great force. This minimal time lapse of 20 milliseconds, or in some cases only 10, 
is present in all of the Bach and Beck syllables we studied. It is explained by the fact that the vortex jet of the k needs this short amount of time to flow the five to seven centimeters from the soft palate to the lips. We can say, therefore, that this vortex jet is generated by and synchronous with the release, just as we have seen in the voiced bilabial stop b. In conclusion, let's look at the morphodynamic development of the entire syllable bek. For purposes of comparison, and to illustrate that this phenomenon is reproducible at least as long as the speaker remains the same, we will now look at the third in the series of four becks spoken by the same female subject on a single exhalation infused with eucalyptus cigarette smoke. First, the image and sound in real time. Beck. Sound only. Beck. Morphodynamics only. In slow motion, with a few pauses and flashbacks to emphasize certain relevant formative factors that we had studied previously. Thanks to our subject's good, clear pronunciation, we captured this uncommon image. It is an angular, rhythmic shape, which in reality is three-dimensional. This sheer field of rhythmically distributed patterns can also be observed in certain cloud formations. This phenomenon, however, can also be the imprint of a so-called advancing shock wave. In other words, a strong, sudden wave of pressure that develops where dense, compressed air alternates with more rarefied air. Those familiar with anthroposophical speech formation and eurythmy will be reminded of Steiner's lecture course on speech and drama, especially the lecture of September 21, 1924, in which he has this to say about the sound k in the context of feeling the essence of the sounds. In speaking the k, we have the distinct feeling that we are attempting to build something like a tower or a pyramid. He draws the shape on the chalkboard. The sensation is very clear that we are attempting to harden or ideally to crystallize the air. This is actually the feeling we get when we speak the sounds. We sense that formed bodies are being projected into the air. 
Steiner goes on to explain that it is highly advantageous to imagine the form of a crystal, a tower-shaped crystalline figure, when we speak the sound k or practice it in eurythmy. Having seen the laser image reproduced above, we can only be astonished at the precision of Steiner's indication. Clearly, his figures of speech are not chosen at random. Zinke noted this phenomenon with regard to the consonant k and attempted to capture it in drawings. On one of her still photos, I used red lines to emphasize this rhythmical subdivision in the morphodynamics of the k. Tinka's notes on the vowel E and our proof using laser illumination. Tinka observed very complex internal vortex currents in the morphodynamics of the vowel E and attempted to capture them in little sketches. These currents seem to intertwine even before they exit the oral cavity where they then form a pyramid, with its base aimed diagonally downward. This pyramid is formed by four main currents. Viewed in profile, it displays the triangular outline, here in yellow, of the typical form of the vowel E, as made visible to date. The vowel E Image recorded with laser illumination, no sound. First, viewed from below the chin. Second, frontal view. Chin and nostrils. First, we see two dense, clearly distinguishable vortex jets. In reality, there are four, but as seen from below, each jet conceals a second one flowing out above it. Now a frontal view of the speaker's face. We see her chin and lips, her nose with a white protective band-aid, part of the microphone on the right, and on the left the assistant's hand holding the eucalyptus cigarette. Viewed head-on, there are actually four very complex vortex jets occupying the space. They form a pyramid, with its base outermost and its peak at the mouth opening. The entire figure is pervaded and crisscrossed by internal vortex currents. This montage corroborates one of Johanna Zinke's sketches, and makes more details visible. As the example of the vowel E makes clear, each sound is a complex, regular, chaotic system. Regular because its overall structure is defined by an outer boundary and because it is reproducible. Chaotic, because it consists of a turbulent, that is, incomputable, chaotic medium. We might also say that each sound is a morphogenetic field, to use the term coined by the English biologist Rupert Sheldrake, or a strange attractor, to use the terminology of chaos theory, a cosmos all of its own. In highly condensed form, the sculptural structures and forming forces that we otherwise see spread out in large format as a macrocosm in nature, in the sky, and even in the galaxies, flow out of the microcosm of the human mouth. But in human beings, they resound and 
speak. Speech is this invisible creation in the air. And more than just sensitive chaos, an expression coined by Novalis and made familiar by the impressive book of that title by flow dynamist Theodor Schwenk, it is speaking chaos, a human living recreation of the creative cosmic word. This Romanesque capital is a beautiful example of speaking mouths creating the world through the word. It is often found in medieval buildings. Note the great variety of vortex formations and plant forms streaming forth from these primordial mouths or faces. From galaxies to blood circulation to the internal structure of the DNA in our cells, these dynamic, chaotic, formative processes are at work. They shape all life. That the world, the tree of life, was created by sculpting forces from speaking mouths, that is, through the formative forces of the word, is more than just a beautiful image. Apparently, people in medieval or even earlier times still experienced the air currents involved in speech with a dreamy peripheral consciousness. Today, technologies such as laser illumination and high-speed cameras enable us to truly understand, for the first time, that these imaginative pictures have a basis in actual fact. Tinka observed the morphodynamic changes in the flow patterns of several vowels when sung on a scale. Here are two of her original photographs of the vowel A. Ah. The characteristic sculptural aerodynamic figure of the A ah dissolves into little ascending, winding clouds of smoke. Tsinka was unable to discover any correlation between these smoke ringlets and the pitch of the tones. Here we can see something important, namely, there is a great difference between the singing voice and the speaking voice. Singers hold on to their breath for as long as possible, releasing it gradually in a way that is very different from speaking. The flow currents, especially the vowels, leaving a singer's mouth lack true sculptural definition and always move upward. Here, speech sound becomes the servant of musical tone and musical phrasing. The voice takes wing and is transformed into something like a freely soaring bird. Red-winged blackbird. These photographs were given to me by a world-famous American reporter, Robert Bucati. One of them won an Image of the Year award in 2003. He photographed this blackbird at sunrise in very cold air. Meanwhile, ornithologists have learned that there is a close connection between a bird species' song 
and its movement and flight patterns. Here we see movement coupled with sound production, gesture with speech production.